first of all, I think it's it's interesting how when you you grow up with this with these teachings, it's still possible for you obviously you and your brother to to go astray in your own ways. Yes. It, when you guys are like you know, obviously in a family you love each other, do do members of the family try to guide you or do they kind of let you guys go on your path? <laughs> right? Cuz this is something that you have to it's your own path. No, that's a great question. Right? Yeah, I'm just curious how it works. I can, I, as a father, I'll answer it as uh, as best I can to like combine the two. Being my father's eldest, I got to witness uh, Doctor Miguel Ruiz, Apprentice Miguel Ruiz, and Don Miguel Ruiz. All right, Doctor Miguel Ruiz required you to have straight A's. You know, grades, grades. You know, that's it's. It was definitely like. Yeah, you straight still, to the point. Yep. You know, he shared what he knew, like the condition, the condition in domestic. But as he began to do his own journey and undomesticate himself, uh, let go of conditional love, uh, apprentice Miguel Ruiz is a combination of both, a combination of requiring this, but he's learning to undo that. So there's a, that element of like letting me figure it out for myself. Kind of like when I became uh, an apprentice to my grandmother. All right, you, this is what you're going to do, and this is the rule. There it is. You know, it's like that's a little bit of doc, Dr. Miguel Ruiz there. And it works, you know, because I got straight A's. I, I got uh, a good scholarship or a grant for UCSD, and I, and I really did pretty good with my academics with that sort. I, I, I was a pretty good student in international baccalaureate and all that. It worked. But Dr. Don Miguel Ruiz... Now, he taught differently than his previous versions as a father. Don Miguel Ruiz was more of a lysis fair. Uh, if you wanted to learn how to swim, he would push you into the pool and pop, 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 like that. I can't swim. Miguel, swim. But that, I can't swim. Yeah, Miguel, swim. But that, I, Miguel, your head's above water. You're swimming. I'm doggy paddling, but I'm like, he's right. My head's above water. I am actually doing it. I'm like, oh. And now I am doggy paddling everywhere. I'm like, oh, this is, okay. It's not the graceful thing that I thought it was supposed to be. It was like, all right. So he teaches us that way. He sets up a situation and lets us figure it out. Like, for example, with my education, in Mexico, you're only obligated to go to school to uh, eighth grade. That's by law. High school education, it's not mandatory, which means that in order to go to high school, you have to apply and do an entry exam. Like the way you uh, uh, take an exam to go to college and get admitted to a college. In Mexico, you have to take an entry exam to be accepted to high schools. That's how you get in. If you don't get, if you don't pass that, you're not getting into the high school. So that's, that's the system. So my father at that point says, okay, Miguel, your education is now your own. You are responsible for it. To, for you, you will learn what kind of life you want based on the actions you take. If you want to go to high school, go to the school and find out what they need in order to get enrolled. And that's what I did. I went to the schools and I applied and I got into Preparatoria Lázaro Cárdenas. That's the name of the school, the Lázaro Cárdenas uh, Federal uh, High School Preparatoria. And I discovered the International Baccalaureate, the IB program, and I, I enrolled for that, and I tested for that, and I got in. And I realized it's my own test, and if that's what I want, and then I learned that the rest of my life. I, if I wanted to go to college, if I wanted to do SAT, I would do it myself, that kind of self-reliance. And the fact that I was taking care of my grandmother, like uh, being an apprentice, where like part of me was like this caregiver that I, want, I had a lot of responsibility right off the bat. So it was one of those things that he taught me how to trust myself into making choices. And if a choice doesn't work, just to quote him, like a quote from him would be this. There's no such thing as a good or bad choice. There's other choice that you like and that, uh, with a consequence that you like, sorry, or a choice with a consequence that you don't like. A consequence is not good or bad, not wrong. It's not a punishment as most people associate the word a consequence with. A consequence is the result of the action you take. What kind of consequence do you want to experience? So from that point of view, if you like the consequence, enjoy it. 
If you don't like the consequence of your choice, don't let personal importance stop you from correcting it. Don't let your ego stop you from correcting it. My friend, Heather Ashamara, she's a, she co-wrote a book with me, uh, The Seven Secrets of Happy, Healthy Relationships. And she has for a, a lot of her own books, uh, Warrior Goddess uh, Training and things like that. Uh, she has an analogy that describes that pretty good. Imagine a heat-seeking missile. A heat-seeking missile is only correct 1% of the time. The rest of the time, it's correcting, correcting, correcting. It's always correcting its course, trying to hit that heat signature. So imagine a heat-seeking missile with personal importance or ego and says, I am a heat-seeking missile, and I'm supposed to hit it right off the bat, 100% of the time. Well. If it needs to correct, but it has that idea that it has to get it in the first try, it won't correct because the ego won't let him. So imagine that with us, not correcting our course because our image of self says, I need to get it perfect right off the bat, get it right. And that's where personal importance comes in. Basically, my father taught us to learn from our mistakes, to learn from the consequences of our actions. So as a father now, how would I apply that with my son my son and my daughter? My son has autism, so I have to really have a totally different, reinvent the whole thing. Like the ABA therapist taught me a, a, how to be uh, and how to raise my son from that point of view. And then I have my daughter, and she's pretty much that ap- approach. Like we let her figure things out. Of course, we nudge her here and there. And my wife is this disciplinarian, and... She and I have the same agreement. She would tell the kids, if you do this, this is the consequence. If you do that, this is a consequence. Which kind of consequence do you want? So that's the way we were raised. But in contrast, you know, the, the main problem that the four agreements addresses is something like called domestication, a system of reward and punishment by which we model the behavior of an, an individual, where if we live up to the expectation, we're worthy of a reward. And since we are emotional beings, That reward feels like acceptance, which feels like love. And when we don't live up to an expectation, then we're worthy of the punishment. And the punishment feels like rejection or a lack of their love. It's the way we learn conditional love. I love myself if I live up to my expectation. And that's the problem that the four agreements in every single one of our books addresses in different ways and facets. So you can say, for example, take me. Hello, my name is Don Miguel Ruiz Jr. I don't take things personal. I don't make assumptions. I always do my best. <gasps> I forgot the other agreement. Oh, no. How can I call myself Don Miguel Ruiz Jr. if I don't know the four agreements? And there is a diatribe for punishing myself for not right. living up to that image of perfection that is Don Miguel Ruiz Jr. who doesn't take things personal, doesn't make assumptions, always does his best, and he's impeccable with his word. Thank you very much. If I live up to that image of perfection, then I'm worthy of the name Don Miguel Ruiz Jr. I'm worthy of, the, of being a Toltec. But if I fall short again, like forgetting the fifth agreement, be skeptical, there's a tra- diatribe punishing myself for not living up to that image. And that's the motivator most of us do. We have to live up to an expectation. If we want to live up to the family name, if we want to live up to this expectation or whatever image someone has of us, then we forsake ourselves and pretend to be something we're not in order to achieve that agreement or condition in this case. So in this, in this example, I use the four agreements. The telltale sign that we use the four agreements as an instrument of domestication is judging ourselves for taking things personal, judging ourselves for the rest of it. And at that moment, we corrupted the four agreements and turned it into the four conditions of our personal freedom. We call it the four agreements, but it's it's a complete corruption. Now we're using it as an instrument of conditioning or domestication. And we still think we're practicing the four agreements, but we're practicing the four conditions. I love myself if I live up to it. As soon as I practice the four agreements, then my life will be better. But that's the corruption. And I became aware of that. I became aware of that when, when the previous com- answer, when I was telling you about how I began to heal myself in that. Uh, uh, my biggest heartbreak was pretending to be something I am not, is that I realized that I corrupted this tradition, and just as I corrupted so many things, and trying to live up to an image that doesn't exist. It's kind of like, for example, since Jose was in your show, let's say 
that to to be perfect is to be 100% completely free of any flaw. Well, let's say that my mind says, in order to be perfect, I have to weigh 170 pounds, look the way I look when I was 27, and have hair like Don Jose Luis Ruiz, <laughs> who has beautiful <laughs> hair, beautiful hair. But I look at myself in the mirror, and that's just not the truth. I'm 48 years old. I weigh 188 pounds, and this is the truth of my hair. And because I'm going to live up to that image of perfection, I'm going to castigate myself when I look at myself in the mirror. You fat, you <laughs> ball fat, you all ball fat. Whenever, if we look at ourselves in the mirror and we feel the sting of that judgment, we're punishing ourselves for an image that doesn't exist, that we're comparing ourselves to. And that's what domestication is. That sting that we see ourselves in the mirror, whenever we see ourselves and we judge ourselves for the way we look or what we don't have, that's conditioning. That's domestication. And and how do we let go of that conditioning? Because I a lot of us are stuck in that box of these expectations. Yes. And that's where a moment of clarity comes in. It's like the moment you become aware that you're doing it. It's kind of like an alcoholic, uh, a drug addict that has a moment of clarity. It's like you come out of a bender and you have this huge hangover. But my dad calls it the minimum opportunity. You know, And drug addiction, alcoholism, they call it uh, a moment of clarity. It's the moment where you realize what you've done and what you've created. It's like you're waking up from the stupor of the bender and you see the truth of what you've done, but you have this hangover. And you know that if you take a, open up a bottle of beer or take a shot of tequila, the hangover will go away because it's the hair of the dog. That's the popular expression. And you're punting the problem for another day. But in that moment of clarity, you can make a different choice. If you see what you're doing, that's the moment when you take the step in a different direction. And you say, no, I don't want to continue with this. I will start letting go of it. And the first step is letting go and be able to detox, which is painful and just let the hangover come and that's a very dangerous position some, to some of us but it is the step that allows us to heal so to let go of domestication or in this case conditional love starts by acknowledging 